Let's continue. Um, so, here we are. Okay, uh, I am contending that she, she does know something about the angel's god. Uh, your predecessor made him chief of the magicians and conjurers and Chalde Chaldeans. We saw that way back in chapter 2, after Daniel interpreted the dream. We've seen those events. Because of superior spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams and visions were found in this Daniel, uh, we've seen that. That, was, that kind of description was specifically mentioned of Daniel back in the day by Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, and I think again in chapter 4, it was said that type of description was made of Daniel. And do you remember in chapter 4, Daniel said, uh, Belshazzar, okay, Dan or he said, Daniel, whom I named Belshazzar after the name of my gods, okay? In other words, all the point I'm making is this section right here, as a reader, you're supposed to say, yep, check, yep, I remember that, yep, I remember when that happened, okay, yep, we're just reviewing, <laughs> we're reviewing a little bit. And it also illustrates that this queen was there. She's familiar with all this. Let Daniel be called, and he will declare the interpretation. Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, okay? Uh, this feeling of you are that Daniel kind of, uh, it's the sense of you're that guy, okay? I, sort of, I, I've heard of you. You sound familiar. Your name, I recall. You're that Daniel. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Can I join tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Well, here in the class, so. Join us as long as you want. Sounds great. <laughs> Uh, and your name? John. Okay, John. Great, good to meet you. Joel Arnold is my name. Very good. We're in uh, Daniel chapter 5, talking about Belshazzar the king. So, uh, you are that Daniel, that guy I've heard of. And, and I want you to notice this from among the exiles of Judah. Okay? Yeah, it's still that. Okay, by now, if I remember right, uh, I think Daniel is in his 60s or 70s. Okay, so this has been a while. It's been a while. And, and he's still called the guy from the exiles of Judah, which, is, is this included in here uh, because the king is prejudiced? Very possibly. Foreigners, you know, that kind of feel. But I think more importantly, from a theological standpoint, the passage just wants to keep on reminding you, hey, this is all about God's people, okay? You're one of the exiles from Judah. God's people, God's people, God's people. That's, that's the equation. The book of Daniel is... Is, is not. If, if we came away from the book of Daniel and we said, this was about how Daniel was a cool guy and, and, and so he was successful because he was cool. Okay, That would not be the point of the book. The point of the book is Daniel's a guy who trusted in God who's one of God's people and God exalted Daniel because he's one of his people who trusted in him. It's that connection back to being one of the exiles of Judah and being faithful to God that makes Daniel unique. Yes. I think it's interesting how the queen actually refers to him as Daniel, and then secondarily the Bel Belteshazzar. Uh huh. Uh huh. So then they're kind of, they're saying that God is my judge in the original Hebrew, correct? Yeah. Because yeah. Right. Of that. I know it's there. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. all before I never noticed anybody called him actually Daniel. You know what? That also um, I've never thought of this before, but um, <laughs> it's interesting. People, did I bring that this up in this class or not? I don't know. Um, let me just make a note. Thank you for sharing that thought. Uh, people will bring up to me, I've had multiple people say to me, or ask me, why do we call uh, the three friends by their Babylonian names, and we call Daniel by his Hebrew name? Doesn't that seem inconsistent? We talked about that? No. no. We didn't? Okay. That was the other class then. That's the problem with teaching two different sections of the same thing. Um, so, uh, having Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are their Babylonian names. Okay? Daniel is the Hebrew name. And so it's kind of inconsistent, isn't it? We call Daniel by his Hebrew name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names. Um, well, my answer to that is, if you do a search of these names in the book, there are, I think, two times that Han the names Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah get mentioned. Okay? But there are like five or six times that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get mentioned. Okay? There are like maybe four or five times when the name Belteshazzar gets mentioned. There are like I don't know a number. I'll just make one up. Like 45 or 60 or 80 or something. Times that the name Daniel gets mentioned. Okay? So all we're doing, by the fact that we call him Daniel, we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're just representing what the Bible does. Right? We're just going with the main names it gives. And the reasons that that has, is there significance to that? Well, um, in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what's the main place where they get talked about? Chapter 3, Burning in the Fiery Furnace. In that chapter... The main guys speaking besides them are the Babylonians. So they call them by their Babylonian names. No-brainer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, the place where they get called Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
One of them is in chapter one where they're introduced, and it gives both the Hebrew and the and the uh, Arama or the Babylonian name. And the other place is in chapter two where um, Daniel goes to his friends Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. Okay, so in the mouth of Daniel, he uses their Hebrew names. When they're in the presence of the Babylonians, they get called their Babylonian names. Since the main story we have is where they're walking around with the Babylonians, what do, you, what do we have? Mostly called by their Babylonian names. But since Daniel is all the way throughout the book, and most of the time, uh, like the second whole second half of the book, Daniel's the one writing, he calls himself by the name Daniel. And in fact, this is where I kind of, it's a long uh, footnote there. Back to Logan's point here, I think it was your, you, yeah, it was your comment. Um, back to that, it's interesting to me now to recognize that even the queen is calling him by his name, Daniel. Okay, uh, Way back in um, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar said to him, you know, old Daniel, whom I call Belteshazzar after the name of my gods. So you've got a little bit of this going on, even back in there. Yes, ma'am? And that's just funny that, that they do it that way. Uh -huh. you know, because it, it's always, it always seems like they have to they refer back. Uh, to to either if they talk say Belch, I'm sorry or then they'll say Daniel if they yeah. say Daniel then they'll say his yeah so, yeah. yeah. So, funny. so this gives us a little bit of uh, understanding why you know we refer to them why the book's called the book of Daniel and not called the book of Belteshazzar or something yeah. like that like that yes you need the interpretation of Belteshazzar. Uh, they're so close Belteshazzar and Belshazzar mm -hmm. what's the difference in if I remember right, it's been a little bit since I looked at this, um, but if I remember right, they mean roughly the same thing. And One's a genitive or something. What's that? One's a genitive, I think. Okay. I read. Yeah, I mean, there's some, like, really, you know, minor difference about how you put that syllable in there. But they both come out to mean the same thing, ultimately. So, I'm going off the top of my head here. Uh, just looking if I mention anything about the note. I don't see anything. It does, one of the things that's interesting about it is you do have to keep your mind, uh, if, you know, sharp to remember which one you're doing, because <laughs> they're so close. So, good. Um, all right, so let's keep it moving here. Uh, so, let Daniel be called, oh, we were a little further down. So, I had heard about you. Uh, my predecessor brought you in from Judah. I heard about you that the spirit of gods of the gods is in you. Illumination, understanding, superior wisdom are found in you. So the wise men were brought to me. They were not able to declare the interpretation. But since I've heard that you can do this, read aloud the writing, make known to me the, the interpretation, and you'll get the reward. Purple, chain of gold, third of the kingdom stuff. Okay, I'll do all that for you. Uh, this, I'll just pause and note here. Yeah, so far we're exactly on the old formula. You know, king gets something he doesn't understand. He calls all his wise men. They can't do a thing for him. It's a waste of his time. So he calls Daniel, and Daniel's able to come in and give him an answer. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for you and give your rewards to another. Okay? That's great. It's very humble, isn't it? I think it's more than that. Because in the interpretation of the dream, the interpretation of the dream is you're dead. Kingdom's over. <laughs> if, if this is the last night, like how long, how much is left on the Babylonian kingdom? Ah, oh, maybe two and a half hours. Okay, <laughs> and so basically Daniel's saying like, why would I want to be king of your kingdom? Right? I mean, it's actually, like me with you. Yeah, I don't want to be. Yeah. I don't want to be third in the kingdom. I really, at this point, do not want a promotion because this kingdom is on its way out, right? Uh, somebody said, when the fast cost, I think it was, somebody said, you know, at Hitler right at the end starts giving all these people the title of field marshal or something. Like that. It gives all the people around him promotions. It's like, you know, we've probably got like 24 to 48 hours. Why would I want a promotion? You're just going to, then I'm just going to be carried down to Nuremberg and be tried in the more crimes more crime later on, right? I just want to be associated with a sinking ship. Uh, yeah, it is like, you're going to be, you know, on the way down, you can be captain of the Titanic. There's 30 <laughs> minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your your gifts be to you. Give your rewards, rewards to, the, to another. But I'm happy to read the writing to you and I'll make it known. And the reason he doesn't need to, need to say it and he doesn't say it, the reason that he's willing to make it known is because, well, obviously this is divinely intended, and this is part of God's judgment, it's part of God's will for all the people at the party to hear it. Okay, And the, the story gives us no indication that they're off in a private room, so in all likelihood they're standing there in front of all the nobles and all the, the thousand of his lords and his wives and his concubines. You know, this is a big affair and this is public and they're all there. Comment here? No? Okay. 
Um, so I'm happy to read that to you. You, O King, the Most High God, gave the kingdom and the greatness and the honor and the majesty uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, your predecessor. That, of course, harkens us back to comments that have been made earlier. Okay, The Most High sets over the kingdoms of earth whom he wishes. He removes one king and puts another king in place. One of the big messages of Daniel is God's the one ultimately who chooses every election. God ultimately is the one who chooses every promotion. Nobody gets into office apart from God. That's what this is saying. God did that for your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. Because of the greatness which he gave to him, all peoples, nations, and languages are trembling before him. Uh, this is all really a close echo of words that were in chapter 4, almost a quote of words that were in chapter 4. Whom he wished was dead, whom he wished stayed alive, whom he wished became exalted, whom he wished was humbled. And in fact, that last one, why was that last in the list, humbled? Because of this next comment. When his heart, his own heart, was exalted, and his spirit became strong to act proudly, he was humbled. He was cast down from the throne of his kingdom, and honor was removed from him. He was driven away, he lived like an animal, until, see, you got to know, I mean, we just talked about this last night, you got to read these words, and, and, and all these things need to sound like echoes to us by now. Until he knew that the Most High God is ruler of the kingdoms of men, and sets over whomever, whomever he wishes. I mean, it's, it's just almost exactly a quote of chapter 4. This, is, this, the, this chapter is full of words that are drawn from chapter 4 and earlier. And all of that is tying this whole thing up in our minds as a package. We're supposed to realize all this goes together. Yet you, his descendant, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Okay, significant phrase. Even though you knew all of this. This is why they say uh, some here. Oh. And the point's already been made. Okay, we have two guys. They're both arrogant. Well, they're both actually given the same information. Okay? God, God has allowed both of them to hear what he did, or one case to experience, and the other case to know about what he did in Nebuchadnezzar's life. One guy replied to it, responded to it, submitted to it. The other guy is not. Even though you knew all of this, you have not humbled your heart. And the difference then between Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar is pride versus humility. One guy humbles himself, the other guy says not. Against the Lord of heaven, you have exalted yourself. And if you want to know what that looks like, if you want to know how he exalted himself against the Lord of heaven, I'm sure there's plenty of ways, but the way that Daniel picks out is that they have brought the vessels of his house before you and you're drinking wine from them. Okay, you almost wonder if Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar is sitting at a table and, the, gla and the, the vessels are in front of him. You almost wonder if there's some noble sitting, nobleman or some wife sitting over there and they're holding a glass in their hand full of wine. You know, it's sort of the feeling of, uh, and you're, you have brought them in and you're drinking wine from them. <laughs> clink, 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 clink. <laughs> and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Okay, remember I made the point earlier that this is part of the development of the story. Why are you praising these foolish gods that are just made out of stuff? You're praising those gods, which do not see, or see and hear and do not know. Okay, You're praising stupid gods that are chunks of wood. But the God in whose hand is your life and breath and all your ways, him you have not glorified. I mean, it, here's the, the ultimate amazing difference. Okay, Here's an idol. It cannot breathe on its own. It can't even breathe itself. It doesn't have the capacity to breathe. Okay, Here's the true God. And he gives breath to other people. The God himself, our God, is alive. Not only does he take care of himself, if you want to say it that way, but he is, he is giving breath to anybody who breathes. This idol can't even help himself breathe. Okay? And that's another one of these um, contracts that comes up in Isaiah. You know, In order uh, to carry an idol around, okay, you pick it up and you carry it to the other side of the room and you set it down. You're, you're bowing down to this guy, idol and say, and saying, save me. Don't you think the idol should carry itself across the room, maybe? Um, you put it on a nice, solid base so it won't fall over. Okay? And Isaiah says, I'm the one who sits on the earth. That's my base. I sit on the earth, and actually, I'm the one who supports the existence of all things. Okay? All the contrasts in the world. Does this, <clears throat> it, it, after reading it a few times, it seemed a bit preachy for the guy who was about to die. And then Daniel knows it. I kind of thought perhaps that it was so verbose. It was there's a lot of lessons in this, mostly for the thousand people plus listening, more so than 
Well, also to pronounce a curse on Belshazzar, but yeah. these these people are going to live on probably in the kingdom, and so Daniel's kind of teaching a lesson about his God and their silliness yeah. for when they go on. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot for the guy that's about to die. Yeah, yeah that's good. You may ask, you know, why this long speech, and we could say uh, definitely for the people that are there. Uh, God gets God does get honor to Himself by this being proclaimed and and. You know, Belshazzar being confronted with uh, his sin, even though it's it's just going to end in death for him. And then, you know, obviously record for us, we're talking about it yeah. tonight. Um, but that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, it, interesting. A lot that's said here. So, him you have not glorified. Then was sent out before him the palm of, this hand, of the hand, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing which was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Tekel, Upharsin, this is the interpretation, meinang, which just means uh, uh, numbered, uh, and the idea, of fe the feeling there is kind of like um, God has numbered our days, okay? Teach us to number our days so that our hearts may be applied to wisdom. I think that this, uh, you know, in, in God's understanding, there could be a calendar that was made, one of those rip-off calendars that had how many days are left, and so on a number, you know, that's, that's this represents my life, and on the calendar up here, there's a number on it. Okay? And every day, I rip off another page, and you rip off another page, and at some point you get down to three, two, one, and you rip off that last page, and it says zero, and this means that today I'm, you know, I'm going home to heaven. Okay? And, and basically then, in this case, it's the feeling of God not only numbers people's lives, God numbers kingdoms. Okay? And so here's this big fat calendar, and every day a page gets ripped off. Okay? And basically Daniel says, if God just ripped off the last page of the calendar, he just pulled it back, and it says zero. God has numbered your kingdom. It's over. It's done. Teiko, you've been weighed in the balances and found lacking. Teiko just means uh, lacking, nothing left. You've been weighed. And, and when God weighed you, and basically I say, God measured you. God checked out uh, the true content of who and what you are. And guess what he found? Nothing. He found nothing. There's nothing of value left. Perez, your kingdom has been divided. The word does mean divided. And probably is a pun as well on the word Persians, uh, because there is some similarity in the way that it's spelled. Uh, so Perez is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. I have to mention, I should have mentioned this earlier, I apologize. Uh, I have to mention as well that Isaiah had prophesied specifically about the Persians that they would conquer Babylon. Daniel had prophesied specifically about the Persians, Daniel chapter 2, that they would be the next kingdom after Babylon. Okay, and what's happened here now is Belshazzar the king knows that he's surrounded by the Persians, and he throws a party and says they can't touch us. There may even be a sense when he calls in the vessels from the temple and drinks wine out of them, there may even be a sense right there where drinking wine out of them is saying a way of shaking your fist in the face of God and in the face of those prophecies. Because if Belshazzar knows about that, he's saying, let's see you fulfill it. How are they going to get into the city? It's not going to happen. And Daniel says, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Exactly what you suspected is exactly true. Um, maybe, given what I said, Persians, maybe even uh, Belshazzar saw the word Perez up there and, and wondered about the connection to Persians, and that's some of his fear. Yes? It says Abharsin, uh -huh. and then it says Perez. Yeah. So what is the similarity or difference there? Uh, okay, um, let me think how to explain this. Um, so, like, let's say uh, in English, Obviously, every language is a little different. Uh, but in English, if I'm going to use the verb like uh, reading, okay, what verb does that come from? Read. Okay, is that the same word? Yeah, see, your reaction is kind of like, well, I mean, it depends on what sense you <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, At it's not the, the same word. Same. I see three extra letters on the end of it, okay? But it's the same word as opposed, this is read versus walk, okay? You know, mm -hmm. we understand that this is the same verb, it's just two different forms of it, okay? Ufarsin is, is, is kind of like that. Okay, okay so it's kind of like you look, look up on the wall and you see it says reading, and Daniel says, okay, and so... Uh, as far as that last word, that word read, okay, here's what that means. Okay, it's just the grammatical form of the same thing. But it's the same word, it's just uh, one's a participle, one, I think it's a noun or something. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Like divided, dividing, possibly? Like that's sure. contrast, you know? Yeah, what I mean? okay. that'll work. 
Yeah, it can be like dividing, and then he says, so Daniel says, your kingdom has been divided, given to the Medes and Persians. So, good. Uh, then Belshazzar commanded, and they clothed Daniel with purple and a gold chain around his neck, and proclaiming, concer- proclaimed concerning him to become third ruler in the kingdom. That should be a clue about, it's not a clue, it's a statement about how Belshazzar felt about Daniel's words. Because Belshazzar told him, you're done. Kingdom's over, you're finished, you're going down. And his response to that is to say, oh, okay, here's your your reward. I'm promoting you in the kingdom of Babylon. Okay, let's think two different ways on this. Maybe Belshazzar believed Daniel's words and thought they were true. Okay, if he believed Daniel's words and thought they were true then why would he want to promote Daniel to the third position in the kingdom? That's a pointless thing to do. That's a formality. Just skip it. We're all dead, is what you ought to be saying at that point. Okay? Maybe you ought to be praying or something. Maybe you ought to be getting your sackcloth and ashes out. But I don't think a coronation is in order. If he believes it, it makes no sense. Maybe he doesn't believe Daniel. Maybe he thinks Daniel's lying. Okay? Well, if he doesn't believe Daniel and he thinks Daniel's lying, why reward him for telling a lie? If you think he's lying, then you should say off with your head or something, right? Why reward him? Basically, all I'm saying is, either way, it doesn't make sense. It's total nonsense. He's drunk. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that was what I was talking about in the past class. (laughs) It's just drunk, it's possible. We can can take a lesson out of that in ourselves. Sure. I mean, but the, the deeper reality here is to say, Belshazzar doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. And it, it can remind us a little bit of Nebuchadnezzar when Daniel warned him and said, you're going to be turned into an animal. And so 12 months later, Nebuchadnezzar is standing on the, the roof of his palace and he's saying, isn't this Babylon that I have built my, for myself by my power? It's sort of like, well, hey man, you thinking? Okay. But, but it's more than that because at least De- Nebuchadnezzar finally came around. Belshazzar never came around. When Daniel says to him, you're dead, like tonight, dead, then he's, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you so much for interpreting it. I give you reports. See, I mean, just, you're, you are supposed to read this last section of this chapter, and your heart is just supposed to be falling and just incredible, incredulous, laughing, and, and it's like, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. What a buffoon, I guess. Yeah, well, this guy's nuts. You have to let me keep on going with this. Because next verse, in that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. He's dead. Name's written on the tombstone. It's over. I mean, this is, it's dramatic. This has got to be one of the most dramatic passages in the Bible. So they rewarded him. Oh, that same night, he was dead. It's so, it's so compact. <laughs> the, the words are just, they're just put right in there. Um, I have to make a point here. I think... Down here, I put the number, I think it's eight words. The interpretation was 27 words, Hebrew words. The end of Belshazzar's life is recorded in six Hebrew words. Okay, basically, that's all the attention God gives to the end of the life of Belshazzar. That night he was slain. In Hebrew or Aramaic? Good, good catch. Aramaic, thank you. (laughs) Good job. Yeah, this is six Aramaic words, thank you. (laughs) So, yes, that same night... Cat Belshazzar is dead, and it's so compact, just a handful of words to say it. And, and I have to make a comment as far as this relates, too. Uh, you and I, looking at this, would think, hey, this is a big deal in human history, isn't it? Right? I mean, this is, this is epic. I mean, the, all the history books, all the ancient history books, this is one of like the biggest, most important stories they record, the story of how Babylon fell. It's a huge deal. It's, it's just an epic detail. And, and basically, by it being packed in here in just two verses like this, God is saying, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one kingdom goes down, another kingdom goes up. Details. It's just details. It's not even significant. It's not really even that interesting. Let's move on to the important stuff. Uh, I said to the men the other night, and we'll come to another passage that, that points this out to us, as far as God is concerned, or as far as we're concerned, we say, what's the significant stuff of human history? And we list things like battles and kingdoms and politics and big changes like this. That's what we list as the big important stuff of human history. And and a passage like this is teaching us to learn, if you want to know what's the big important stuff of human history, the answer is people coming to trust in Jesus Christ, people coming to follow him, God's people being protected out of trials, 
That's the big stuff of human history. And that's why the chapter gives 29 verses to talk about the humiliation of Belshazzar and how God sent this message to him. Now, that's important. Okay, how he died, we don't even need to talk about. It's not relevant. I mean, there's a detail that is very, very interesting, a very neat thing. You're probably familiar with it. But the way this worked for them to get in, they dammed up this river. This is a huge river, okay? And they actually dammed it up and diverted the water off into a swamp. And they were able to walk in the empty riverbed and come into the city, and they just popped up right in the middle of the city. There they are, okay? So all the soldiers are around the wall, and they're around this wall, and they're all looking over the wall and like, okay, let's make sure these Persians aren't able to get in. And, oh, no, actually, they are in, by the way, guys. They're in, okay? Uh, this story I mentioned to you earlier, where Belshazzar, uh, he was, or uh, Belteshazzar, uh, earlier, no, Belshazzar <laughs> earlier, had come in and he, um, he had killed this friend, or this guy his age, okay? That was the son of one of his major generals, why the historians tells us that that general defected from Babylon because ever since his son had been murdered by this king, ever since then, that general had had a grudge against the king. So he defected and he went over to the Persians, and he's the one that told the Persians, hey, here's how you could get into the city. And when they popped up in the middle of the city, he was the first guy in. He's from there. He knows the streets. He knows how to get straight to the capital, castle. He walks straight to the castle. They forced their way in. He went in and he personally killed the king as a way of getting revenge for having killed his son. So uh, there's a lot of details that the Bible could have commented on that would have made for some great reading. Right? This is interesting, exciting. This stuff reads like a novel. It's a fun story. It's not even interesting. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk about how God worked in his people and accomplished great things. That's part of the point of this chapter. And, and it ends then with us needing to learn this lesson right here okay, about how God deals with arrogant people. Okay, I saw a couple of questions that I ignored. <laughs> so let me come back. I'm sorry. Uh, Adam, do you have a question? Go ahead. I think one thing, like when you read like how quickly uh, Bel Belshazzar died yeah. on that night, like you sort of think, well, like God gave her a chance to never get an answer. But when you really look at it, and, and you see that he knew, Belshazzar knew what had happened before, and, and, and even in the fact that he clothed Daniel yeah. with that purple robe and yeah. that, it was, it was a sign of arrogance, wasn't it, that he, he wasn't going to humble himself. Yeah, yeah. 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 One of the pastors commented and said, doesn't this seem to illustrate to us the difference between sinning without knowledge and sinning against knowledge? That in some way Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't know a lot about the God of the Hebrews. Belshazzar had heard all this and he still sinned. You know, it's the guy who has never heard the gospel and so he does. He lives a sinful life, but then one day he hears the gospel and he gets saved versus the kid who grew up in a Christian home and says, I'd like to run off and do all these wicked things. I need mean, all the difference in the world. That's one thing it illustrates. But, yeah. Uh, Bot over here. I think, I don't want to play the devil's advocate, but I'm going to just for this uh, one instant, the fact that yeah. uh, Belshazzar, he said that he was going to do something, and he does it. Yeah. I mean, he's a man of, it, to me, it seems like he's a man of his word. Uh -huh. Like, he said, I'm going to do this, whoever does it, okay, he did it, okay, yeah. here, I'm going to die. I did what I... Yeah, promise I said I was going to do, but so that's my devil's advocate. Maybe that doesn't make sense to people, but I think it makes sense to me. Yeah, that's possible. Well, um, do you, are you going to go on to another thought? Or yeah. I, well, I was, let me let me comment on that and then come back okay. to your other thought just while we're on that. Um, no, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, I would tend to take it less of like um, he's being an upstanding guy and fulfilling his word, more take it of like a, he's got a safe face. Is what I would tend to think. You know, one of the factors that's here is. The thousand people all heard him say that, so he's kind of got to save face and, okay, I've got to do this. Um, but to play the devil's advocate back, what I would say is uh, the, the reality has changed, hasn't it? In other words, if I said to you, um, if you will do such and such, thus and so for me, and uh, if you will give me this information, and you give me the information, and what I, I learned from the information is that, I don't know, the world's about to fall apart, then at that point it's like, Oh, okay, the whole game just changed, didn't it, right? Sure. And in particular, let's say it this way, if you really believe what Daniel just said, promoting him isn't a favor anyway. Mm -hmm. What's more, Daniel asked for you not to do it. Mm -hmm. Daniel said your gifts and your rewards are for another. Okay, so 
if there's any sense of like, well, I'm morally obligated because I said I would. No, you're not morally obligated. Daniel said don't, <laughs> right? I mean, so you can just skip it. Um, so why do it anyway, right? Um, there's a sense in which he actually pushes back against Daniel when Daniel said, I don't want your rewards. And he says, no, 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 here you go. You got to think, wow, oh, man. I'm not sure how much, uh, and what the continuity of thought. Like, remember uh, when when uh, Herod in the New Testament makes a decree that whoever, whatever you ask, I'll yeah. give it to you in front yeah. of a council. This sort of same thing is happening here, I right. find. Yeah. Uh, so his word, not only is he saying, I'm going to give you gifts, I'm going to make you third in the province. It's almost like, to me, like, my word is spoken. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do for you. And to continue that thought, God sovereignly is working underneath here to exalt <laughs> Jewish people or Hebrew people to, yeah. Yeah. to rule the kingdom, which will... You know, obviously lead to the rest of the story, but yep. I think it's it's God undermining, saying no matter what. I mean, God used the words of, of His exaltation to Daniel, yep. and then He continued yep. it on. He got promoted yet again, even if it yep. was a yeah. minor, a few hours maybe. But. Right. Yeah. No, I I definitely I can see that. As far as the um, Herod thing, I think it's interesting in the Herod parallel. Uh, it's particularly says that um, because he was ashamed. It particularly says that because he, he'd said the word and he was embarrassed not to fulfill the word. Yeah. In other words, in that case, it was definitely, uh, I'm saving face because everybody heard me say this, so I've got to do it because I said it. Uh, and the other thing, of course, the other, the big difference between this and the Herod thing was that in the Herod thing, they came to him and they said, okay, I want this and you have to give it to us. Where in the Daniel case, he said, don't give it to me. And he still insists that he's got to give it to him. Uh, that would be one difference there. I do think from a literary standpoint, I think you're very much on target when you say this, uh, this um, I'm going to exalt you enough, I'm going to promote you again. And I, I've stopped doing this, or I, I didn't do this on chapter 4, because of course it doesn't happen, the pattern doesn't happen in chapter 4 as before. Uh, but at the end of chapter 1, okay, they got promoted, didn't they? At the end of chapter 2, they got promoted. At the end of chapter 3, they got promoted. By now, the reader is kind of starting to expect that the last verse of each chapter or towards the end of the chapter there's going to be a promotion right promotion is the way you end a chapter in the first five chapters of the book of Daniel um, that's the way it feels and so I agree from a literary standpoint for sure that here in chapter four here's the way I would tend to draw it it's kind of like a half promotion or something oh, pardon me I should write chapter five shouldn't I uh, we're, we're talking about kind of like almost a half promotion because, I mean, it's a promotion to a, key, to a position you don't want. Hmm. And the reason I say that is, um, it's very, a point I want to make in the next chapter, it's very much this feel of, why do, you, um, wh why do you want to be promoted in a kingdom that's only a few hours from falling? Well, historically, when you go back into what was kind of the pattern, it's pretty typical when the, the empire changes, the new guy comes in, he just kills everybody who's in position, and he starts over with his new guys. And you don't really want to keep the old bureaucracy. I mean, that's just what they did. Historically, they just, they just kill them all. Because, well, you don't know if these guys are loyal to you or not. If they're dead, you know that they're you know, going to not be a problem. So you kill them all, and you go get your guys, and you put them in those positions. So one of the miracles of the book of Daniel is that chapter 5 happens, and then chapter 6 happens, and he's still alive. And even more importantly, chapter 6 happens, and he's still in high, exalted position. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. How on earth are you a politician? How on earth are you third in the kingdom, and you manage to live through this experience, and they don't just knock you off? Well, that's the point that Daniel, Daniel would be to say, that's another miracle from God, that God has exalted his people. So I say that would be kind of like a half promotion, because he sort of got promoted into a position you wouldn't want, and you'd think, that's going to be dangerous, I don't want to be promoted to that position. And in fact, no, God used that too, and he did. Just him surviving could be show everyone the glory of God, whereas other people might have been executed, this guy, Daniel's still alive, like, still what's going on? This guy won't go away, this guy is always here. Yeah. He was the sober official the next morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was just him and the queen. They were the only people that weren't drunk. <laughs> Everybody else had hangovers, hangovers if That's they were alive. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, Adam. Uh, I don't understand how like, people like of this like, significance kind of hide behind the scenes, uh, like Daniel, because like, they keep bringing him out. Uh huh. You know, like nothing's mentioned on that in the backdrop of the story. I, I find it very interesting. Yep. Like, don't you recall what happened with this? You know how the queen's talking. It's like, who's third in the kingdom? How is he not 
known about everywhere. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, well, and she even mentions whom your um, predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, exalted over all the wise men of Babylon. You know, she, she even brings that particular thing up. Um, so, yeah, we don't have any basis in the text, text for knowing what happened in between there. How did, was he just forgotten or, you know? It was it's like, very interesting to me. Oh, he's just an old man, so we're not listening to yeah. him anymore. You know, he's probably late 70s or early 80s. And is he still ruling in, uh, in the council of the Chaldeans in this time? I'm going to suggest probably not, because, I mean, but the text wouldn't tell us one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest probably not, because she has to remind him that the king had set him over the Chaldeans. Uh, when he calls all his Chaldeans and wise men, Daniel didn't come. Of course, that also happened in chapter 4, and or chapter, yeah, chapter 4, um, and that happened definitely in chapter 2. So, you know, okay, maybe, but I'm going to suggest that, no, he probably doesn't. Even Belshazzar's, um, Belshazzar, Belshazzar's uh, description to him, you are that Daniel from the, uh, he brings up this description, and it's like he describes who he is. You're that guy. It's not like, Oh, hi, Daniel. Haven't seen you until today. Like or a legend or something. Why didn't you come to my party? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, wow, so-and-so just walked out of the dust. Now all of a sudden you're out of it. Yeah. Okay, because it's reasonable to think Daniel Kyler probably went into the backdrop if God wasn't purposing him to do anything further. It seems like Daniel, when he does confront any of these guys, God's giving him a direct purpose to, right? Uh -huh. So I can't, I can't see Daniel just wanting to hang around these guys all the time while they drink and do all their stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he has a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar eventually comes to a point where he trusts in the true God. You know, but then over time, these guys, obviously, very, very pagan and debauched. And it's like, why would I even want to be here? Yeah. 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 Um, I just can't help but see that there's a lot of emphasis towards, like, condemning the pride of these people. Yeah. And not even so much, like, so it's condemned here and there, and obviously God is angry about it, but it's not so much even, like, other things that they could be being condemned over. Like, so many things, like, the, their religion itself. It seems primarily God is stating, I'm the one who controls these things, not you guys. Yep. So I just found that emphasis to overshadow so much, whereas, like, Daniel could have been condemning them on all sorts of points, right? Exactly. But that seems like such a intended theme. Yep. Yeah, good. And what you're doing when you say that, those words, what you're doing is you're, you're observing and you're recognizing that there's a certain particular theme in here. And it's helpful that you're doing the theology side of this, yeah. okay, which is what we want to head towards at the end of the book. And, uh, and what you're recognizing correlates perfectly with the other themes we've observed, doesn't it? Because if Daniel teaches us that God is in control of all things and that all the human, the kingdoms of earth, well, they're weak and powerless. God only places them in those positions out of his goodwill and his graciousness to them. Okay, if that's one of the themes of the book of Daniel, of course it is. Then uh, the idea of one of those weak and powerless kings that God gave them a position going, wow, I'm awesome, is exactly all wrong. Right? And so it's natural that pride would be one of the key issues of the book, right? Because you've re you, you've not recognized the truth that God is the one in charge. Um, I did put up a chart for the the other class, uh, the pastors, and it was something like this. I'll go ahead and put it up now. Uh, but we'll say God's people, okay, and the pagans. All right. Just when I write that up there, that itself is one of the themes we've talked about, isn't it? Yeah. God's people versus the pagans. And, and what the idea is, uh, that one of the ideas that comes regularly through the book of Daniel is that God gives revelation to all of them. I mean, God gave revelation to this king. God gave revelation to... Uh, no, there's, uh, the book is full of dreams and visions, isn't it? I mean, every chapter, practically, we've had some kind of major dream or a mention of dreams and visions. Even chapter 1, Daniel was given wisdom in all dreams and visions. So, I mean, every chapter has some of that content. 2 through 5 all have, they all revolve in some central way around a dream or a vision. Revelation comes to all these guys, okay? Here's the difference. These guys believe it. These guys reject. Or I should say probably unbelief. All right. The result of that is that these guys are proud. When, when, if the revelation is, I, God, the true God, am in charge of the world, and you reject that, then what you've concluded is, no, God's not in charge of the world, I'm in charge of the world, if you're the king, right? 
The king says, God's not in charge of the world, I'm in charge of the world. So he rejects it, and that's a form of arrogance. God's not really in charge. The, the, the believers, they accept it. We'll say, uh, pardon me. They accept it in belief, and the result of that is humility. So Daniel walks in front of the king. He is the answer man. He does have revelation. And Daniel says to the king, it was not because there's any different thing different about me. There's nothing different about me. It's because God gave me revelation that I'm able to tell you this right now. Right? I mean, very humble in his response. And, and finally, the last result of that is that God blesses his people in their humility. And God judges the pagans for their pride. And we have a progression there, don't we? Right? Everybody gets the same revelation. Here's the big, big difference. Belief versus unbelief. That's where the, the, the paths cross, right here. That's where they split. The paths divide right there. And the result of that divide is that these men are humble, and, they, and God blesses them. The result of this divide is that they're proud, and God judges them. Okay? And, and this, in kind of a brief synopsis, it really encompasses a lot of the book, a lot of the theology of the book. So I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. But it's nice to say some of this now, because now as we have remaining chapters, now we can start seeing some of this. We're far enough in that you know what I mean, and we have far enough left that you can see this as we keep on going.